I'm Carmine Gallo with Ozan Varol, a best-selling author who not only wants us to think like a rocket scientist, he is a rocket scientist, having worked on the Mars rover exploration mission. Ozan, congratulations on writing a book that many consider to be one of the best business leadership books of the year. Thank you so much, Carmine, and thank you for having me on here. Uh, you bet. You bet. What a wonderful, wonderful book that weaves in rocket science and, and creativity. I think a lot of readers are going to be surprised that thinking like a rocket scientist does not mean having to get a PhD in astrophysics, but it's, it's really about unleashing the creative side of your brain. There's a lot of, of right brain thinking in this book. Yeah, that's exactly right. I wanted to write a book, not about the science behind rocket science, but the like the critical thinking skills, the decision making skills, um, the approach to failure that rocket scientists use, because there is such a gap between what rocket scientists have figured out and what the rest of the world does. And, and that gap exists in part because we tend to put rocket scientists into their own corner and say, well, this rocket science, I, you know, I can't learn anything about that because it's too complicated. I wanted to write a book that bridges that gap and that shows how anyone can take these simple strategies from rocket science to be able to make giant leaps in their work of life. And we are going to look at some of those strategies, several in particular. Before I get started, though, Ozan, if you are advising recent graduates, young professionals or aspiring leaders, especially those who are entering the sciences or another complex field, what role would you tell them communications will play in their future success? I think it's one of the most important skills that a young scientist or really a young professional just starting out can have. And that applies to both written communication and verbal communication. I think being able to distill what you've been working on, uh, a complicated subject, into language that anybody can understand and tell it in a captivating way is, is a rare skill, but it is so valuable. And that's why I think the people who have mastered that skill really tend to stand out. Uh, the name that popped to mind is, is Richard Feynman. You know, there's so much complexity in, in an area like quantum physics, for example, but you jump on YouTube, type in Richard Feynman, pull up any one of his video lectures, it's impossible to not be captivated because he takes this seemingly esoteric, seemingly complicated subject and breaks it down and explains it in a way that anybody can understand. And, and you can just spend hours getting lost in some of his videos because he has that skill. I mean, he's obvious, he's a Nobel laureate, he's an expert in, in what he's talking about, but he also has the ability to zoom out and look at that topic from the perspective of someone who knows nothing about it. And I think that ability to shift your perspective and to communicate whatever it is you might be an expert on to a lay audience is one of the, I think, the rarest, yet one of the also the most important skills uh, of, of modern times. I think communication, both verbal and written communication, is essential to what, what we do regardless of what industry you're in. You have to be able to communicate your ideas, uh, to, to be able to reach out to other people and to connect with them. And I think one of the most rare um, and rare yet really important skills is to be able to communicate complex topics in a simple way that anybody can understand. Um, and, and I say it's rare because when we become experts on a particular topic, an expert doesn't necessarily mean that you have a PhD in it, but expert as in you've spent a couple of weeks thinking about that topic and, and writing about it. It becomes really difficult for you to convey what you've learned to somebody who knows nothing about that topic. Communicating complex topics in simple language, which is easier said than done, takes practice, takes work, but you say that simple is sophisticated. How do those scientists like Richard Feynman or Carl Sagan, another person you mentioned in the book as being a great communicator, how do they make the complex simple for the average person to, to understand? I think one of the things that 
Carl Sagan, Richard Feynman, and other scientists like them have mastered uh, is first principles thinking. So first principles thinking is a way of taking a complicated subject, a complex system, and breaking it down to its smallest fundamental subcomponents. So you're letting go of everything. You're letting go of like names you may have absorbed. You're breaking it down to its essentials and building it back up from scratch. And I think both of them are able to do that. They're able to look at a complex theory, break it down to its essentials, and then build it back up from scratch in a way that makes sense to them and in a way that makes sense to to a beginner. And I think people who can do that also then, because when you're able to break down a complex system yourself and build it back up in a way that makes sense, you then position yourself also, you put yourself in a better position to be able to do that to, to somebody else, to be able to communicate that thought process to somebody else because you built it yourself. You're not just relying on you know, something that you may have heard in a book somewhere. You're not just relying on complicated names or theories. You're relaying it in a way that um, that makes sense to you and it makes sense to you because you broke it down and built it back up from scratch. Is simple language, effective communication skills, great presenting skills, are those skills that can be learned and developed and refined in your experience? For sure, I think. Um, I think when when we're first starting out, I don't know of any sort of natural born communicators. I think we all stumble along the way. And I was certainly in that position. Um, in my early years in academia, I'm a law professor. That's my day job now. I did this pretty significant pivot and I left rocket science. But in my early years, I had trouble in communicating these subjects like constitutional law that I was an expert on to an audience of lay law students. They were just beginning and they, had, they knew nothing about constitutional law. And, and it was after trial and error and, and reading a number of resources that I began to understand how to communicate myself. Uh, and actually, one of the books that was really helpful was your book, Carmine, Talk Like Ted, which I picked up at the very initial stages of my keynote speaking career. And I found it immensely helpful in putting together a captivating presentation. So absolutely, I think just like any other skill, this can be learned. And just like any other skill, uh, when you're first starting out, you're not going to be great at it. But just like any other skill, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it as well. I'm so glad you mentioned Talk Like Ted, one of my public speaking books. See, that that explains it. That explains why you are such an extraordinary public speaker. No, it's oh, certainly, no, no, that's certainly, I'm that's certainly, that is certainly part of a card line. I really, I mean, it, the book is on one of my shelves up here somewhere. I really greatly benefited from reading it. No. It's on my shelf too. Fancy that. <laughs> <laughs> right next to think like a rocket scientist now. <laughs> Perfect match. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, it is interesting though, because th I, I love this whole idea that you talk about uh, creative communication and writing because you're an astrophysic physicist by training. Yep. Uh, I don't want to stereotype an astrophysics a physicist, but this is a really beautifully written book. Um, it, it's not full of dense science and jargon. How did that come about? How did that evolution in your writing come about? You, you didn't learn this when you were to, uh, getting your PhD. Yeah, for sure. I think I, I think two reasons. Number one, um, the struggles I had early on in my career as a law professor really informed what I did later on. So what I just mentioned before, with respect to being really in the weeds on constitutional law and then learning over time to really break it down and convey it, convey that complicated subject in a way that a first year law student can understand helped inform everything else that I do with my life, uh, the way I communicate verbally and the way I write as well. Um, so that's number one. And number two, I also had the benefit of having left rocket science. I think I was straddle when I wrote Think Like a Rocket Scientist, I was straddle straddling this boundary between insider and outsider. I had experience in the field having worked on the, as you mentioned, the operations team for the 2003 Mars Exploration Rovers Project. But then I did this major pivot and went into law and became a law professor. And when I wrote the book, 
I was looking back on that experience from with fresh eyes. I was no longer as immersed in it, in the subject as I was. And so I think that gave me a leg up in that outsider status, gave me a leg up in, in writing a book about rocket science that even non-rocket scientists could understand and, and get a lot uh, out of. Let's pick up on a few other topics in this book other than communication. Mm -hmm. One topic in particular, I actually think this does apply to public speaking and communication, is how astronauts maintain their calm Mm -hmm. when things go wrong. Here's what you write. All you need to stay calm in a high-stress situation is knowledge. Can you explain? Sure. So astronauts are portrayed in pop culture as these like, you know, hot shots, space cowboys who have the guts to just sit on top of a rocket with, you know, with the same uh, power as a small nuclear bomb. That makes for a good drama, but it's really quite misleading. Astronauts, um, they use knowledge to reduce the uncertainty associated with, with a rocket launch. And what I mean by that is they figure out as much as they can about how the spaceship is, is supposed to operate. And they focus on the variables within their control. Um, one of the things that, and I'm, I'm seeing this quite a bit in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic with, uh, with really businesses and people, is we tend to control things that are outside of our control. And then we don't try to control things that are within our control. Uh, so this, I actually had a first-hand experience with this. My book came out in April at the height of the pandemic. And I spent several miserable days waiting or wanting for the universe to deal me a better hand. My book tour got canceled basically. And, uh, and this is my first mainstream book and I was crushed and I was trying to control what cannot be controlled. And then I decided to think like an astronaut and think like a rocket scientist and actually shifted my perspective and shifted my focus to the variables within my control. What is mine to control and what is mine to shape here? And, and that allowed me to create a number of virtual events, uh, do virtual book tours that I think actually ended up being far more successful than a physical book tour ever would have been. So going back to the astronaut example, you know, John Glenn, this is a famous example, when he was sitting on top of an Atlas rocket, his heart rate uh, clocked in at between, I think, 60 to 80 beats per minute. Uh, and when the rocket was taking off, it only rose to about 110, which is astonishing. And it's not because Glenn has superhuman nerves. It's because he was focusing on the variables within his control, what he could, what he could shape, and his own knowledge as opposed to the variables outside of his control. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the connection between that mindset and, and speaking as well. I think one of the ways to reduce uncertainty, to use knowledge to reduce uncertainty, is to test and experiment. So to put yourself in uh, the same position that you're going to be in when game day arrives. And game day could be a job interview, but it could also be a keynote speech. I see a lot of beginning speakers make this mistake, and and a lot of people do this with job interviews as well. They practice in conditions that don't mimic reality. So if you've got a job interview coming up, you know, you sort of like have a preset, predetermined set of questions you might give them to your significant other, and then you're sitting in this comfortable environment of your living room, and then your sig- significant other is asking these questions to you. Well, the reality is going to be very different than that. You're going to be sitting in an uncomfortable suit across the table from a stranger in this high stakes admirer. Same thing with keynote speaking. It's one thing to practice a keynote speech in front of the, you know, the mirror in your bathroom. It's something else to get up before an audience of a couple hundred people and actually deliver that speech yourself. And so one of the things that I did when I was first uh, starting out to apply this principle of making the testing conditions as, as close as possible to reality is to give my keynote speech in front of an audience of strangers. I would, I would drink a couple cups of coffee beforehand to give myself like the type of jitters that I might experience on, 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 on real day. That's creative. Okay, keep going. And that that gives you because that's the that's the sort of environment that you're going to be in when you're giving a keynote speech. And and the closer you can make the testing condition or the experiment experimenting condition closer to to reality, the better off you're going to be. The better prepared you're going to be. And uh, because you know exactly 
what conditions will be awaiting you, awaiting you once that moment arrives. You artificially elevated your heart rate with the caffeine. No, yeah, that, exactly. that's very interesting. <laughs> And I love the fact that you're you are you are practicing in front of in front of people. Uh, most people don't even think of doing that, and so when they actually get on the presentation stage, they get they get really nervous. Uh, you can't see it, but here in my office, I've got windows, uh, a lot of windows, and uh, my staff often make fun of me when I'm practicing for an upcoming keynote presentation of any type because I'm walking around, I'm walking around, I'm talking to myself, and people walk by. <laughs> what's What's gotten into him? Uh, yeah, you have to actually practice as you would. I try to even get there early and go onto the stage, especially if it's a big stage and there's a lot of people there. Uh, it, so it, it's very interesting. It's very similar. I remember speaking to uh, the astronaut Chris Hadfield, who gave a very famous you know TED talk, and the the the, uh, the, the, the singing astronaut, right, Chris Hadfield, right, and he went blind in space, uh, the uh, chemical that shut his eyes. And uh, when I asked him how, you know, if he panics or if he if he was scared at all, he, he looked at me and said, Carmine, do you know how many thousands of times we practice that situation? And that's exactly what I was thinking about when I read that portion of your book. It's th- There's fear that comes from not knowing what's going to happen, that uncertainty. But if you practice in the right conditions, like you've just said, that gives you a lot of confidence in, in almost any situation. Yep, absolutely. And then you're spot on with respect to astronaut training. And part of the training involved in um, in becoming an astronaut is, you know, you've got these supervisors, mission supervisors, throwing thousands of scenarios at you, every scenario imaginable, so that your reaction uh, often becomes second nature. You know, there isn't anything that you haven't simulated uh, that you'll encounter in space virtually, virtually anything. And so having practiced all of that and, and knowing exactly what to do when that type of failure arises in space, that makes the astronaut's job easier. And it also calms their nerves because they've, they've seen everything. They've trained for everything. Let's talk about another topic. Get bored more often. Now, this is a very real problem because social media apps and digital devices are made to keep us hooked and active on that platform. So we spend less time just in quiet or boredom with our own thoughts, what you call unstructured time free of distractions. Why uh, why is unstructured time free of distractions, including digital distractions? Why do you consider that so important for, to, for us to become our creative best? If you're like most people, your best ideas will come to you in those moments, the the unstructured moments of like a lot of people get their best ideas in the shower, for example, because you are in this environment, you're just by yourself, you're free of distractions, and your mind drifts. We assume that when you're daydreaming or when you're getting bored, your brain sort of shuts down, but it's actually quite the opposite. What happens when you daydream is that this region of the brain called default mode network. Uh, which is associated with creativity, lights up. And your subconscious begins connecting the dots and begins making associations that's necessary for original insights to emerge. But we don't, as you said, Carmine, we don't allow room for that because we're moving from one email to the next, one notification to the next, without pausing, deliberating, and reflecting. And all of that is, is essential to creativity. I tell so many stories in the book about scientists literally walking themselves into the right answer. You know, they're stuck with a problem. They'll go for a a walk in a park somewhere, and then the answer will just come to them. And it's not because they're getting this divine inspiration. It's because they're they're giving room to their subconscious to work on the problem, to to make associations. Um, And this could, you know, for Einstein, for example, this was playing the violin. He would be stuck in a problem. Yeah, he would he would walk away from the problem. He'd pick up his violin, he'd start playing it, and then he just in the middle of the song, he'll say, "Got," it. and then he'd go back to his desk, having found the solution to the problem. Now he had the luxury of not having smartphones in his life, and so we need to be very intentional about this. Uh, if if you do want to increase your creativity, the best thing you can do for yourself is schedule time to just be with your thoughts, free of distractions. Uh, 
in, in my own life, I call this airplane mode. And I will put this on my calendar. So I'll, I'll structure 20 day in 20 minutes out of out of um, every day, basically, where I sit on my recliner with a notepad and a pen, no agenda, no outcomes in mind. And I'll just jot down whatever comes to my mind. And by the way, 90% of what comes up is useless. But I find that you need to get rid of the useless stuff for the gems to emerge. And some of the the very best ideas I've had in, in recent memory, including the idea for, for writing Think Like a Rock, a Scientist, came in those moments of, of solitary reflection. Um, as the saying goes, it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. Even when you were a scientist, even when you were on that Mars exploration project, you're saying that even in those complex scientific environments, some of our best ideas come during those moments of, of isolation and thought free of distraction? Absolutely. I think it's, so isolation is really important. And of course, you don't want to isolate to the exclusion of everything, everything else. It's that switching back and forth of mental states between isolation interaction. So isolation, coming out with original insights, creative insights, sharing them with a group, stress testing your opinions with them, and then coming back to isolation, that and research backs us up as well. That mode of operating works best. And unfortunately, modern work environments and modern brainstorming sessions aren't conducive to this because you just skip over the isolation bit and go immediately to interaction. And when you look at the research, some of which I cite in the book, that is not when creativity thrives. It thrives when you're moving back and forth between isolation and interaction. Yeah, this is one of the most important uh, aspects, I think, of of success, especially for people today, because I've talked to a number of neuroscientists recently in interviews just like this who have brought up the same thing. The, these devices now are, and anyone who's watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix would know, right. that they are created to keep our attention and to remove our attention from those other valuable pursuits that, that we should be focusing on. Uh, and so I love the word that you used, intentional. Mm -hmm. it, I, I'm not one of those people who think you have to go on, you know, some month long fast from social media. I'm not really into that. That's, but but I think you do need to be intentional about creating those times free of distraction. Absolutely, um, and I think it's the difference between impulse and intention. Often we're operating an autopilot, and we pick up our phone out of an impulse to get ahead of dopamine, to just check, quickly check Instagram or the news to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if you structure your day intentionally and build on those moments of airplane mode, and if you use social media and build in those moments intentionally and not impulsively, uh, you'll begin to see immediate changes in your creativity. I love this quote. The next time you feel boredom arising, resist the temptation to take a hit of data or to or do something productive. And here's, here's the, one of the best lines of the book, as far as I, I, I can see. Boredom must, no, boredom might just be the most productive thing you can do. Exactly. Th there's uh, so much in that phrase, you know, it just, there's volumes of great content just in that one sentence. And I think it also depends on how we define productivity. Um, I think for me, my definition has changed over time. When I was a practicing lawyer, productivity was all about how many hours I was billing a day. And now my definition of productivity is, you know, did I make good decisions today? Did I come up with good ideas today? Did I generate original insights today that might lead to my next book or, you know, next viral article or video? And I think if, if you're looking at productivity through that lens, then absolutely boredom is one of the most productive things you can do because the most creative insights and the most original insights are going to come to you in those moments of, of slack, not hard labor. Let's pick up on this creativity theme. The concept of what Einstein called com combinatory, combinatory play which is exposing yourself to different ideas and combining those ideas into productive thought. You've got a whole chapter on this. Uh, that reminds me of Leonardo da Vinci and actually and Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, who said uh, creativity is just connecting things. So it, is this idea of combinatory play 
taking ideas from different fields and combining them into the the field or the problem that you're you're trying to find a solution to? Yeah, absolutely. That's I think an, another essential part of creativity that unfortunately gets neglected in the modern world, which tends to focus too much on specialization. But life doesn't work in these isolated silos. There is so much to be gained by exposing yourselves to different disciplines, different industries, different knowledge fields, and creating and combining ideas from them. So you mentioned Steve Jobs, Carmine. Uh, one of the famous examples from him is he took this when he was uh, attending Reed College. He took a class on calligraphy, uh, not because he thought it would have a, you know, a professional benefit at the time, but because he was interested. Well, fast forward to when he founded Apple and started designing software, that calligraphy class became essential to the fonts that he used in, in, in the Macintosh. Those proportionally spaced fonts came directly from this calligraphy class that Steve Jobs took in, in college. Uh, another example that comes to mind is Charles Darwin. Uh, you know, Charles Darwin was studying species, but his approach to evolution was very much involved by a textbook he had read on, on geology, which said, you know, the geological features that we're observing tends to happen over time, gradually, uh, not by a momentous event, but as like wind and rain and water chip away at the earth over time. And he thought, huh, I wonder if the evolution of species also works like that. Uh, and he had also read a book on economics, which argued that, um, the scarcity of resources creates this competition for survival for the most adaptable um, species. And he said, huh, that's also interesting. That might also apply to evolution. And so, you know, there were people at the time who had read this geology textbook. Uh, there were people at the time who may have read this economics textbook, but it was a rare person who had studied geology, who had studied, who had studied economics, and it was also studying species and he was able to combine these different disciplines to come up with, uh, with the theory of, of natural selection. Uh, a modern example is from Reed Hastings, the co-founder of Netflix. He, uh, before he co-founded the company, he was a computer programmer, I believe. And he had incurred a bunch of late fees for renting Apollo 13 at his lo local blockbuster. And he's working out of the gym. He's upset about having to pay $40 in late fees. And it occurs to him that at his gym, he could pay, he could pay $20, $30 a month and work out as much or as little as he wanted. And a thought came to him. And going back to our earlier discussion, this was in a moment of slack. Like he wasn't listening to anything. He was just there working out. And a thought occurred to him. And, and he decided to take that idea from the fitness industry and apply it to the video rental industry to create Netflix. And it's, you know, um, you pay one fee, uh, set fee per month, and you can watch as many movies or as little movies as you want. And so what's commonplace in one industry can be breakthrough in the other, but often we're not combining those or making those connections because we're we're you know we're reading the same books uh we're reading our you know the magazines associated with our industry we're only going to conferences that um our industry organizers put together and we're not being exposed to to ideas from different disciplines and if you look at successful business people in the modern world they tend to be outsiders to the to the industry that they crashed that they disrupted because they could take these ideas that they picked up from one industry and apply them to the other. You've reinforced something that I've thought about for years. I'm going to take it one step further. In my experience, the best, most interesting communicators are those who pull from a diverse number of fields, from science to history to technology and pop culture to make their point. They're more interesting people. I can almost tell at this point, almost instantly, within a few minutes of having a conversation, whether someone is well-read in a diverse number of categories. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things I try to do and think like a rocket scientist as, as well. I didn't just want to give rocket science examples. And so if you read the book, you'll find examples from 
we talked about first principles thinking. There's examples from stand-up comedy and how Steve Martin used first principles thinking. There is examples from the, the food industry, how the, uh, the three-star Michelin restaurant Alinea used first principles thinking to, to really reimagine what a restaurant can do. And as you said, Carmine, I think when you combine those examples from different disciplines, you become more interesting. And I think your points resonate more strongly because if one example from one industry doesn't land with the audience, then another example from a different industry might. And I think one more thing that just occurred to me, I think your points also become more persuasive because it's one thing to say, here's a strategy that rocket scientists have used to make giant leaps, but then you're going to leave some question marks about, well, can other people take that strategy and use it as well? But if you're giving examples from different industries, then I think the point you're making becomes more persuasive, more compelling, because you're saying, look, not only did this work in rocket science, but it also worked in stand-up comedy. I was glancing at the book as you were talking because often I've read so many books. I read about 50 books a year, and the index often tells me how interesting it's going to be. Uh, which is exactly what you were talking about, because it's not just the obvious examples. Right. As soon as I started reading the book, I thought, oh, well, this this is different. This is really different. And it's teaching me something that I didn't know before. A lot of business books uh, are derivative. Right. They uh, Or they're glorified calling cards. They're made to elevate somebody's professional career. But they're, they don't really teach me anything new. Uh, but if a book teaches me something new in every chapter, and I think people can tell just by this conversation, uh, we have covered so many topics that uh, when you see a book that says rocket science, you you wouldn't even realize that we're going to go and delve into such topics, especially these creative topics. So it's uh, you sure did a great job, Ozan. You must be very proud of yourself. And the, and the fact that you pivoted, it was so fascinating that you pivoted in April because this came out in COVID and you had to cancel that book tour. And yet it still became a uh, very successful and considered one of the best business books of the year. Again, it's just, uh, it's congratulations for everything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carmine. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you.